The study of ancient Egypt and of the history of human civilization itself is full of contradictions and mysteries. The remains of Egypt's ancient and mighty megalithic architecture feels almost otherworldly in today's modern times, and the more we discover about them, the more they seem to just tease us with their secrets. I want to tell you a story about one of these mysteries, about one of the verifiable signs of advanced technology that must have existed at some point in the distant past. This specific mystery has been investigated and debated for 150 years. It's been studied by pioneering explorers and gentlemen scholars, by mainstream Egyptologists and archaeologists. And it's certainly been investigated by independent researchers, the so-called alternative history authors of our own modern era. Yet despite all this investigation, despite all of our modern capabilities and our extreme capacity for understanding, we are still left with something we simply cannot explain from within our current version of history. Nor is this something that we could even replicate accurately today. This ancient mystery is a clear indication of advanced technology, of a type that is unknown to us, and it has a signature that is currently beyond our own capabilities, which is what makes this story so astonishing. In this video, I'll show you the proof behind these claims. This is the controversy and the story of the mysterious tube drills from the Old Kingdom period of ancient Egypt. My name is Ben, and this is Uncharted X. If you've watched the content on my channel before, you'll know that I've mentioned these tube drills and their marks a few times in various videos about ancient sites. I've always been fascinated by them and by the other signs of advanced machining, like the circular saw cuts or the machined surfaces, and by the precision objects that you can find across many of the ancient ruins and remains of Egypt. I plan on taking a dedicated look into each and all of these topics, and I'm starting with the tube drills. So if you stick with me to the conclusion of this video, I think you'll find the topic of ancient tube drill machining to be just as remarkable as I do, and also find it to be convincing evidence of what can only be described as a lost ancient form of high technology. The story of the tube drills is one that stretches over 150 years, with many different explorers, scholars and authors weighing in during that time. From the legendary William Flinders Petrie's works of the late 1800s, to Egyptologist Mark Lehner's PBS special that aired on television, to university studies that used electron microscopes, and to the revolutionary publications of modern-day manufacturing engineer Christopher Dunn. These machining marks have been a hotly debated subject for quite a while now. I've reviewed and researched many of these arguments from both sides of the debate, and in the case of the tube drill marks, I believe that debate is now over. But before we get into those details, let's first understand exactly what it is that we're talking about. The phenomena of these ancient tube drill marks is something that can be found across many sites that are still left in Egypt. They're often found carved into these stone blocks or these stone slabs that are the remnants of megalithic architecture. Evidence for tube drill use is also found on various individual objects usually ones that display other aspects of precision, like the many giant boxes that are carved from granite and other incredibly hard substances. Or they're found on the Old Kingdom statues. In many cases, there is a tube drill mark between the feet of these statues. And many of these statues are found in museums all around the world. The use of tube drills is perhaps most notable, though, at some of the oldest of known ancient Egyptian sites, the Old Kingdom sites of Abu Sir and Abu Jarab, where there are many examples to be seen carved into blocks of granite or basalt. There are tube drill marks on and around the pyramids and objects at Giza. Cores from the drills have been recovered here, as well as at Saqqara and on an array of other ancient sites. The tube drill marks and the cores range in size from small, like these holes that are drilled into the lip of this box, right up to quite large, 12 to 14 inches even, as is shown in this just incredibly unique coffer or box that sits in a corner of the Cairo Museum with four just gigantic tube drill holes in it. Part of the mystery of these tube drills is that we most often see them worked into just some of the hardest materials on earth, materials like granite or diorite or basalt or schist. This is not an exclusive trait though. There are some examples much rarer than the examples we see into granite, but there are examples of tube drills that have been worked into softer stone, like alabaster or travertine, as shown here on the just beautiful alabaster hotep at Abu Jarab. 
There are a couple of aspects of ancient tube drilling that are quite important to understand because both the debate over this topic and the evidence for the high technology really comes from these technical details. As the name implies, these were tube drills. They were not a solid drill bit. The drills themselves were hollow and quite thin, and you can see some evidence for just how thin they were by the lip that is left in some of the holes, like this amazing example which was made into basalt at Abu Sir. The tube drill action itself produces cores of material that needed to be removed once the drilling was done. And this material removal was in fact their primary purpose. Tube drills were used extensively for this purpose on many of the precision objects of ancient Egypt, in particular the boxes and the precision slabs, but also as I said on the statues. There's evidence to suggest that they were also one of the tools used to create the vast array of just astonishing stone vases, jars, and the delicate objects like the infamous schist disc that's here in the Cairo Museum. These small stone objects and jars are a notable mystery just all on their own. They're incredibly precise and some of them would be very difficult for us to make even today. Yet most of them come to us from the very oldest of times in Egypt. Some 40,000 of them were found under the oldest pyramid of them all, the Step Pyramid of Djoser. So I guess you can just rack up yet another incredible achievement for the Old Kingdom. Some of these objects are admittedly from times before, like this incredible hollow tube of lapis lazuli, one of my favourite little things in the museum. It's labelled, actually labelled as pre-dynastic, and it's housed in a case next to some bone ornaments and some mud pottery. To me it seems like just yet another contradiction in the story of history. This is yet another out of place object just trying to escape notice. So we have tube drill holes on the sites and on objects, but we also have tube drill cores that are in the archaeological record. After a hole had been drilled into a slab, the cutting tool was retracted from the hole and then the stone core was snapped off, most likely with a chisel, and then it was removed. Many of these tube drill cores that were snapped off have been found and some of them have been quite well preserved down to this day. Even though they're ancient, the drill cores themselves still show clear machining marks and these marks come in the forms of lines or grooves that are etched into the stone itself. These grooves in particular will prove to be a very key part of this investigation. Another interesting signature of this tube drill process is the fact that the holes and the cores themselves are actually not straight. The top of the cores taper slightly inwards the deeper that the hole is cut. Now, some of you might be looking at these examples and thinking to yourself, well, there's no mystery here, Ben. This has all been solved. There was a TV show. It was a PBS special. It had Egyptologist Mark Lehner, and they showed how all this was done in that special. They used copper saws. They used copper tubes. They poured sand and water into the hole, and then they just proved how these holes were made. Well, in return to that, I would say that, yes, I do know all about this documentary. And although the experiment itself was really commendable, we should always be trying to learn more about these topics through experiments like these. Their conclusions really don't have anything to do with the evidence that's available to go and look at that's in the archaeological record. Over the course of this video, I'll show how the methods shown in this PBS special have been debunked multiple times in relation to the markings that we see today on drill cores and drill holes and that the conclusions that were reached in this special and the paper trail that exists behind them are demonstrably wrong. And we'll come back to this special a little bit later on, but on one level I can certainly see how it's very easy to just conclude that the dynastic Egyptians made these marks, as these marks are on their sites and they're found amongst work that was conclusively produced by the dynastic civilization. This conclusion is the only acceptable conclusion for the mainstream, however, when you think about it. It just seems to be the corner that they've painted themselves into in our orthodox version of history. So any new or contrary evidence is just simply dismissed with the claim that the Egyptians must have done everything we see, as there were just no other civilizations in that area before them. This claim is rigidly adhered to, no matter the evidence for a high degree of precision in some of these objects. Or the fact that there seems to be an entire class of out-of-place precision objects that are hidden in amongst the rougher work of the dynastic Egyptians. The possibility that some of these sites, all these objects, might have been inherited by the dynastic Egyptians and then worked on, perhaps even written on with their primitive tools, this possibility is just flatly rejected. The only acceptable premise when it comes to the mainstream opinion is that the dynastic Egyptians must have done all of it. Evidence for multiple levels of technology is just non-withstanding. And they must have done all of it with their primitive capabilities and their rough hand tools because there is just no other option. 
It's becoming increasingly hard to cling to this premise, however, as much new evidence is showing that our past is likely a lot more complicated and that these ancient sites are far more nuanced than we had ever previously thought. These machining marks and the other ancient mysteries like them, they also begin to make a lot more sense when you view them from the perspective of longer timelines, of lost ancient high technology civilizations, and from the perspective of inheritance, of renovation and of reuse. My favourite example of something that makes absolutely no sense at all in our current version of history, yet it seems both simply and elegantly explained from this new perspective, is the Old Kingdom itself. Our current version of history states that this period was the very first. It emerged directly from the so-called pre-dynastic Stone Age. Why then do the sites that were supposedly built during the Old Kingdom represent the absolute height of capability of ancient Egypt? The Old Kingdom sites and the architecture represents the best stuff, the most precise work, the most massive work that's ever been done, not only of ancient Egypt, but pretty much of anywhere. And then the dynastic Egyptians just seem to decline in capability for the next several thousand years. This just isn't how civilizations work. The granite architecture and other artifacts from the Old Kingdom all seem to be made from improbably large and very precisely carved granite, or from some of the other hardest substances on Earth like diorite or basalt or andesite. Quarrying this stuff out of the Earth is difficult work. Egyptologists disagree on whether or not the Old Kingdom was even capable of quarrying the huge blocks of granite that have been used in structures like the Valley Temple or in the King's Chamber. Not to mention the enormous single-piece columns and obelisks that date from that period. Other than what could have only been a tiny amount of meteoric iron, the ancient Egyptians were not known to have access to iron or steel tools until the Middle Kingdom. Now logically this is a very tough position to occupy as the mainstream does because tremendous granite works like these are very hard to explain when all you have to work with are flint axes, pounding stones and copper or bronze chisels that are far softer than the material that they're expected to carve. This is nonsense of course. Quite clearly whoever built these old kingdom structures they had the ability to quarry granite and to work with the stone in an almost effortless fashion. There are lots of these sorts of contradictions that are contained in our orthodox story of history, however, and a lot of these contradictions, mysteries like these Old Kingdom structures, they start to make a lot more sense when you consider it from the perspective of inheritance, that maybe the dynastic Egyptians inherited some of their really cool stuff, and over the next several thousand years of their civilizations, they adopted it, they worked on it, they integrated all that into their culture. I want to be clear, I'm not rejecting our understanding of dynastic Egypt, nor am I just ragging on the good work of the vast majority of Egyptology. We know much of the dynastic Egyptians and their culture thanks to this profession. Archaeology has taught us a great deal about many of the civilizations that preceded our own, these civilizations that have risen and fallen in the past 6,000 years on Earth. This period, the last 6,000 years, the period that we are still in today, this spans the entire currently known history of human civilization. This period embodies the orthodox concept of a more or less linear progression of technology that goes from the Stone Age to the Space Age. Yet this period, this 6,000 years, it also represents just a tiny slice of the time that modern humans have actually been roaming around on the planet. And it's a slice that's getting relatively smaller and smaller as new discoveries seem to continually make our species older and older and extends our timelines and our origin further back into the past. Additionally, in recent decades, the scientific community has uncovered considerable evidence for a massive cataclysm, for a planet-changing and catastrophic extinction-level event that happened in our recent past, and I'm talking about the Younger Dryas cosmic impact of only some 12,800 years ago. These new discoveries and this new science point to a possibility of an entirely different premise for looking at ancient Egypt. This new work, it points to the possibility of extended timelines of civilization, of the rise of unknown technologies and of cultures that were subsequently almost utterly destroyed in cataclysm. Strangely enough, this story of extended timelines of highly capable ancestors who went through a cataclysm, this also happens to be the story that ancient Egyptians tell about their own history, as do almost all ancient cultures in one flavor or another. 
If you're looking for more context on these statements, if you take a look at my channel, you'll see that I've made several videos that go into a lot more depth about the Younger Dryas and the events that happened at the end of the last Ice Age. The first time I wrote and recorded this video, it did include a 15 minute investigation into how some of the first hand accounts of these tales have been passed down through religion and things like that, right down through to our modern times and the quotes that are in the book of Revelations and stuff like that. But it's a bit of a distraction away from the topic of the tube drills, so I will release that as a video in the future on my channel. Now that science is backing up the truth that's encased in these legends, with the extension of the human timeline and the evidence for the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, isn't it high time that we took a long and hard look at exactly what we believe is the true history of human civilizations on this planet? So what does all this have to do with tubular drill holes? I wanted to provide some context for the following discussion about them and to show that it's not just isolated claims of advanced technology that are being made here. There happens to be quite a lot of circumstantial evidence that supports the premise that they and the other ancient precision anomalies like them, like the boxes in the Serapium, like the vases in the museum, all of these things have been inherited and are much older than we believe. The evidence for tube drills in ancient Egypt was only first seriously discussed in literature by William Flinders Petrie. He investigated them, as well as many other examples of ancient machining, in his 1883 publication, The Pyramids and Temples of Giza. Petrie spent years living at Giza, using the best tools of the time to exactly measure, triangulate, and to record many aspects of construction in ancient Egypt. And his work is still often quoted in publications today. Petrie was a very precise and mechanically minded man. To me, he seemed much more of an engineer or a surveyor at heart than an archaeologist. Although he was and still is considered to be one of the greatest Egyptologists to have ever lived. Petrie was a prolific writer. Some of his books concerned topics like precision and metrology, and he was one of the very first to bring these aspects of modern engineering to bear on the ancient remains in Egypt. This passage, which is from Petrie's address to the Anthropological Society of Great Britain and Ireland in 1883, and it was later recorded in their journal for 1884, this best captures his approach and how he dealt with the mystery of how the dynastic Egyptians worked the stone. Quoting from On the Mechanical Methods of the Ancient Egyptians by W. M. Flinders Petrie, Esquire. Quote, Though so much labour has been bestowed on the literary remains of the Egyptians, and there are now so many scholars who can read an inscription with ease, yet not a single student appears to have given his attention to the mechanical evidences of ancient knowledge and skill. Beyond cursory remarks on the wall paintings that show technical subjects, such remarks as any intelligent traveller might make, Nothing has been written on the methods by which such marvellous results of skill and labour were produced. The latest writer, Bruch, in his History of Egypt, says of the great diorite statue of Khafra, quote, Unacquainted with the hardness of steel and the marvellous action of those instruments which in our day scarcely allow the artist to feel the trouble of rough work, that primitive race knew how to conquer the resistance of the hard stone, and to animate a lifeless mass with the spirit and expression of life. No master of modern times is capable of giving an answer to the question how they managed to overcome the difficulties of the unyielding substance. End quote. Such then is our present lack of knowledge on the subject, and it was a question of special interest to me while living at Giza, surrounded by the finest examples of architecture and masonry, to obtain such information and collect such specimens as might help to answer this most interesting inquiry." End quote. Petrie's making the point here that although a lot of people study the writing and what the dynastic Egyptians told us about themselves, very few people, and even this is the case today, very few people really study the mechanical evidence for how the dynastic Egyptians allegedly built some of these incredible structures and objects that we see. He lived at Giza for several years, as well as some other sites around Egypt, and he really spent a lot of time investigating this specific mystery. One of the things that I'll mention is that Petrie talks about quartz in some of his writings, and what he's referring to is the quartz that's encased in the granite. Granite's a conglomerate material, it's not a uniform material. It has quartz and mica and hornblende and other materials that range from softer to harder. Quartz is the hardest material, so that's what he's referring to when he talks about quartz. 
Petrie is going to tell us a little bit more about his investigation here, and this is the opening passage from the chapter on the mechanical methods of the dynastic Egyptians in his book, The Pyramids and Temples of Giza. Quote, The methods employed by the Egyptians in cutting the hard stones, which they so frequently worked, have long remained in doubt. Various suggestions have been made, some very impracticable, but no actual proofs of the tools employed or the manner of using them has been obtained. From the examples of work which I was able to collect at Giza, and from various fixed objects of which I took casts, the questions so often asked seem now to be solved. The typical method of working hard stones, such as granite, diorite, basalt, etc., was by means of bronze tools. These were set with cutting points far harder than the quartz which was operated on. The material of these cutting points is yet undetermined, but only five substances are possible. Beryl, topaz, chrysoberyl, corundum or sapphire, and diamond. The character of the work would certainly seem to point to diamond as being the cutting jewel, and only the considerations of its rarity in general and its absence from Egypt interfere with this conclusion and render the tough, uncrystallized corundum the more likely material. Many nations, both savage and civilized, are in the habit of cutting hard materials by means of a soft substance, such as copper, wood, horn, etc., with a hard powder supplied to it, and this being scraped over the stone to be cut, so wears it away. It is therefore very readily assumed by many persons, as I myself did at first, that this method must necessarily have been also used by the Egyptians, and that it would suffice to produce all the examples now collected. Such, however, is far from being the case. End quote. Petrie goes on to discuss the method of stone cutting that he thinks best fits the examples and the evidence that he has. He also outlines and describes for us several pieces of evidence, and these are really key and quite important to this investigation for a couple of reasons. One is that they, they all come to us from the Old Kingdom. They're some of the oldest objects uh, or from the oldest sites of Old Kingdom in Egypt, so you know, 2400 BC or older and also that some of these objects are actually still around and available for examination today. Quote, The principal result of the examination of these remains is the discovery that the stone cutting was performed by means of graving points far harder than the material to be cut, and that the stones operated on were quartz or mixtures containing quartz. The graving points must have been therefore of some jewel harder than quartz, since no metal, not even the hardest tempered steel or osmeridium, is capable of cutting quartz, apart from a mere bruising action. This essential principle, that the cutting action was not by grinding with a powder, as in a lapidary's wheel, but by graving with a fixed point, as in a planing machine, must be clearly settled before any sound ideas of the methods or materials can be arrived at. First, we have a circular piece of granite, grooved round and round by a graving point, the grooves here are continuous, forming a spiral, and in one part a single groove may be traced around the piece for a length of five rotations equal to three feet. Another piece is part of a drill hole in diorite. This has been part of a hole four and a half inches diameter, or 14 inches circumference, as 17 equidistant grooves appear to be due to successive rotations of the same cutting point. We have here a single cut 20 feet in length. Another piece of diorite shows a series of grooves, each ploughed out to a depth of over one one hundredth of an inch at a single cut, without any irregularity or starting of the tool. End quote. Petrie introduces us here to a central piece in this debate, his famous drill core number seven, shown illustrated here in a plate from his book. This piece is of specific importance because it's still around and available for viewing in the Petrie Museum in London. And, in fact, this piece has been closely examined by several researchers in these modern times, including engineer Christopher Dunn. Here's what Petrie wrote about this drill core in his book, in Chapter 19, The Mechanical Methods of the Pyramid Builders. Quote, On the granite core broken from a drill hole, other features appear, which also can only be explained by the use of fixed dual points. Firstly, the grooves which run around it form a regular spiral, with no more interruption or waviness than is necessarily produced by the variations in the component crystals. This spiral is truly symmetrical with the axis of the core. In one part, a groove can be traced, with scarcely an interruption, for a length of four turns. Secondly, the grooves are as deep in the quartz as in the adjacent feldspar, and even rather deeper. If these were in any way produced by loose powder, they would be shallower in the harder substance, quartz, 
whereas a fixed dual point would be compelled to plow to the same depth in all the components." End quote. Petrie also talks about this core number seven in his address to the Anthropological Society. Quote, Another evidence of this is seen on the granite core. There the cutting point, which can be traced, has passed through quartz, felspar, hornblende, and mica without the least interruption. And when we consider the strain thrown on a cutting point and suddenly passing from a soft material to a patch of far harder nature, it is evident that not only must the separate cutting points have been each fixed in rigid setting, but that the setting must have been made with great skill and care to prevent the stones from being wrenched out of it or crushed by it by the sudden strain. End quote. There are two things to really consider here. Firstly, Petrie goes to great lengths, and not just in his books, but at several points during his life, to debunk the idea that these holes were drilled with an embrace of powder or with sand, as this method does not match his observations of a spiral groove. Secondly, he knows that what he is suggesting, when he talks about fixed points cutting easily through very hard stone, is something fantastic and beyond our known capabilities at the time. You can see him reaching for explanations with his talk of bronze tubes and cutting jewels of an unknown type. But you have to remember that while he was definitely faithful to his observations, Petrie was still trying to explain the tube drills from the perspective of the relatively primitive dynastic Egyptians and their known capabilities. The possibility of a more advanced or even high technology civilization that existed before these times was not something really ever considered back then. It's only become a possibility now thanks to much new evidence that's come up in our modern times. There are two methods of stone cutting that are being debated here. One method is the abrasive powder method that you put some sand or other abrasive powder in and you can use a softer substance like copper or wood or something like that to grind that into the granite and wear it away. And the other method is what Petrie's talking about which is this spiral cut almost ripping into the granite of the tubular drill, the things that are indicated via the marks and the striations and the spiral groove that's on things like core number seven. He debated this aspect of ancient stone cutting of the evidence for fixed point cutting versus abrasive powder cutting with his peers for decades after he made these claims. And some of these debates have come to light uh, thanks to some of Petrie's personal letters. In 1983, researchers at the University of Pennsylvania had reviewed one of these historical letter exchanges. They got involved in this and tried to shed some light on the subject. They experimented by drilling granite with several different combinations of sand, water, other lubricants and other forms of abrasive grit. And then they took scanning electron microscope pictures of the cores. They somehow very adroitly avoided mentioning what is the actual contentious point in all of this, which is whether the grooves are a single uninterrupted spiral or if they're just a set of many concentric and overlapping grooves. The word spiral doesn't appear at all in this report. They simply state that all of the marks on drill cores are concentric. And although they dodged this aspect of ancient tube drills and their results were somewhat indeterminate, the study itself was really commendable and it provides an interesting comparison of the various markings between drill cores. Something else that isn't actually mentioned in this report but is significant because of its absence is the lack of testing Petrie's fixed point tube drilling hypothesis. And I think this is because we can't actually do that with tube drills. We certainly can't replicate the spiral grooves that Petrie talks about. So if we can't do it, therefore it's not even possible, therefore don't even acknowledge it. At least that's how I think the logic goes. And as I'll show in the rest of this video, this is actually a pretty common approach when it comes to the mainstream trying to deal with Petrie's observations, or perhaps better stated, to not deal with Petrie's observations. When drilled with dry sand or wet sand, or even with crushed quartz, the drills left no appreciable mark at all on the granite cores, just a rough surface as shown here. When these cores were drilled with emery, corundum, or a diamond slurry, and again they tried multiple lubricants, I know they tried water, olive oil, motor oil, and the process has quite clearly left many concentric rings on the granite core. Just compare these fine concentric rings, they're almost scratches that are left from the abrasive powder. Compare that to the deep and the clearly continuous grooves shown in Petrie's core number seven. It's just not the same thing. Engineer Chris Dunn also replicated this experiment in his book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And here you can see his results. With both the core and the drill hole he made using a copper tube and silicon carbide 80 mesh abrasive. Again, compare these results to the Old Kingdom holes and these Old Kingdom cores. How could we say that these came from the same process? They look completely different. 
Here now we really must turn to an examination of the claim that Petrie made about a spiral groove that goes around core number 7. This really is the elephant in the room when it comes to evidence for ancient high technology, and this is because of what the spiral groove implies. It's also the one aspect of ancient tube drilling that I suspect the mainstream will never ever admit to. And in fact, I'll show how they've gone to some great and even dare I say somewhat deceptive lengths in order to dodge this topic in modern times. Petrie repeatedly states in his work that on drill core number 7 and on several other drill holes and drill cores that he examined, the grooves are not only made by fixed points, but they are formed in a continuous spiral. Here, Petrie explains the implications of this observation from his 1884 article in the Anthropological Society Journal. Quote, a point that should be noticed in the use both of saws and of tubular drills is the immense pressure that must have been applied to make the cutting points bite so deeply into the stone and cut the stuff away so rapidly. The grooves one one hundredth of an inch deep in quartz must need a pressure on the point of much over a hundred weight, and there were probably at least ten points occupied in making the whole breadth of the cut of the saw. This would show that the minimum pressure of at least half a ton must have been applied, and it would seem more likely that two or three tons would be the working load on one of the four inch drills cutting into granite. What also shows this enormous pressure is the rapidity in which the tool sunk into the stone. If we only imagine sawing a block of wood seven inches thick, cut with a saw making one foot strokes, it would be thought quick work to cut down one inch in seven strokes in any but the softest wood. Yet this is the Egyptian rate of cutting, or tearing through, the hardest blocks of stone known, diorite and granite. The wonder is how any bronze tube or saw blade could bear the requisite pressure without doubling up, and how the jewels could be set in any sockets to support them against such a violent drag." End quote. This feed rate or this cutting rate into extremely hard granite that Petrie's talking about, cutting into it like a soft piece of wood with a saw, that's really an astonishing claim. Even our modern equipment of today cannot achieve a feed rate anything close to this. And it's these incredible aspects of Petrie's observation that lures Christopher Dunn into the fray surrounding Petrie's core number seven. Christopher Dunn is a manufacturing engineer with a deep understanding of precision, and he has 50 years of experience in the aerospace and laser application fields. His entry into this particular discussion was an article written in the magazine Analog that was initially published in 1984. In this article, Dunn references Petrie's observations and uses his engineering knowledge to note that the implied feed rate is well beyond any modern drilling capabilities. And he speculates as to a probable process that could create such marks. This article grew in popularity over the following decade and it stirred up quite a bit of controversy. Quoting from Dunn's book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, from the chapter Walking in the Shadow of William F. Petrie, quote, the most startling feature of the granite core Petrie describes is the spiral groove around the core indicating a feed rate of 0.1 inch per revolution of the drill. In my article, I stated that this feed rate was 500 times faster than modern diamond drills, which penetrate at only 0.0002 inches per revolution. The correct way to describe the feed rate would be to say that it was 500 times greater than modern diamond drills, but the rotation of the drill would not have been as fast as the modern drill's 900 revolutions per minute. When I read Petrie's description of this drill core, I tried to imagine what kind of process could replicate it. It seemed very clear that the spiral groove that wound down the core like a drunken screw, Petrie's description, could not have been made by any loose grains rubbing on the granite. Petrie notes that the groove cut deeper through the quartz than the feldspar, which in conventional drilling would actually be the reverse because quartz is the harder material. The action of a tool that reflected a feed rate of 0.1 inch per revolution of the drill was not the work of conventional drilling as we know it and demanded consideration of other processes in its creation. All of these features were considered without the physical examination of the artifact in question, and were considered phenomenal, not just by me alone, but also by colleagues with whom I discussed their relevance. It seemed from the evidence described by Petrie that a sure way to create the spiral groove was to use a process whereby the tool oscillated, like a jackhammer or hammer drill, while it turned. I selected the method to be ultrasonic, because with quartz having resonant properties, it would respond to the vibration and this might explain the deeper cut through the quartz than the feldspar. End quote. 
Now we begin to see why Petrie's observations of a spiral groove and Chris Dunn's article that speculates as to possible causes. We see why this is such a tough pill to swallow for the mainstream. If you take what Petrie said at its value, then it's very hard to explain these observations by using the primitive methods that we know the dynastic Egyptians employed. In fact, we'd have trouble recreating such marks today, and that's what Chris Dunn is talking about. Now, you have to remember at this point in our story, we're only in the late 80s, and there's a lot that happens in the next couple of decades that brings this to a conclusion. Before we continue with our story of Drill Corps number 7 and take a look at how the mainstream responded to these claims, let's explore the nature and the stakes of this disagreement a little further. In the late 1800s and early 20th century, it wasn't Petrie's direct observations or his measurements that were debated. It was what those observations and measurements implied that drew out objections and protests. Fixed points cutting deep grooves into granite or diorite implies an extreme skill in tool manufacture, and the spiral groove implies an improbable amount of pressure on the tooltip. These are the reasons that there is so much resistance from the mainstream towards Petrie's or Dunn's observations about the nature of tube drilling in ancient Egypt. It's because acknowledging this would quite likely begin a true domino effect for the house of history. The mainstream simply can't afford to admit that this evidence for ancient high technology is actually valid. Because if they do, the only possibility this leaves is that if the dynastic Egyptians were not capable of this work as all the evidence suggests they only used primitive methods and tools, then they must have inherited these objects, and these high technology achievements must have been manufactured in some period earlier by somebody that was far more advanced than the dynastic Egyptians. This is a scenario which only leads to one place, the rewriting of the story of human civilization, and a serious adjustment to how we think about the earliest ancient civilizations like dynastic Egypt. It would be a huge shift for academia to admit this, so is it really any wonder that there's so much resistance to this idea? Let's take a look at the mainstream resistance to Petrie and to Dunn. It centers around a simple principle. Never admit that the grooves are spiral or helical. If you claim the grooves are concentric or horizontal, then there is no incredible feed rate into the granite, and there is no requirement for a tremendous pressure on the tooltip, and you can pretty much just explain everything by tube drilling with abrasive powder or with sand. This was indeed the premise of Egyptologist Mark Lehner's PBS special that aired on TV in the late 90s, and it purported to explain how the ancient Egyptians cut stone. I've linked this segment or what there is of it that you can find on YouTube in the description below so you can watch it for yourself. Mark challenges one of the team to show him the answer. All right, we have a big block of granite here. So how's this copper gonna cut this granite? In this PBS Nova special, they go outside in Egypt and they test bronze chisels, bronze saws and tubular drills on granite. And they debate whether it was just sand or sand and water that were used along with the softer metal in order to cut the stone. So they start their experiment and after a few days of making some poor Egyptian fellows work in the sun, grinding on the rock, they show off their incredible progress of barely more than an inch into the stone. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. They pop out their drill core and declare victory. Wow! You pop right out of there. Oh, look at that. that. Woo! Yes. That could be Fourth Dynasty, Dennis. Petrie's work and his observations aren't actually mentioned in this at all, and as with the Penn University study, neither is the word spiral or helical. Now, I don't want to nitpick this to death. It was quite clearly done for a television audience. It wasn't a real attempt at a scientific study or anything like that. But there are a couple of things about this that I just have to mention. For example, this is how they claim to start the cut for the horizontal bronze saw. So you're going to chip a groove and then you're going to put the copper and slide it back and forth. We're going to put sand inside the groove and we're going to put this saw on top of the sand and then let the sand do the cutting. How then did they start this hole for the tube drill? It just isn't addressed. Also, note the blatant use of steel chisels here in order to break off the drill core. They had bronze chisels as they were shown earlier in the documentary, so why didn't they use the bronze instead of the steel? Because as it turns out, it's not easy to snap off a chunk of granite with a bronze chisel, as the bronze just bends against the granite. When Chris Dunn experimented by drilling into granite with a tube drill, he also found out that he could not break the core out with a copper or a bronze chisel for this exact reason, 
and he notes that he had to resort to using steel chisels in order to snap it off. And you can see the exact same thing happening here. This is a serious flaw in the primitive model that the mainstream seems to want to stick to. They also never compared their work to the real Old Kingdom drill cores or drill holes. We just get a quick look at the drill hole, Mark Lanner declares victory, and that's it. That could be Fourth Dynasty, Dennis. Now I do want to say again that this experiment itself was quite commendable. We should always be trying to find out more about these topics by doing experiments like these. But the conclusions that were reached here really have nothing to do with the evidence that's in the archaeological record. We never see a comparison of this core to Petrie's core. We don't really even get a close-up look at any of it. And I've got to imagine that Mark Lanner knew about Petrie's observations, he knew about Petrie's claims going into this. And he doesn't mention Petrie, it just never gets addressed at all. So at some level, to me, this whole documentary is something of a red herring that's put up there in order to just avoid even talking about the things that Petrie was saying and his claims of a spiral groove. And this really is the meat of the argument that I've kind of exhaustively tried to expose here. It all comes down to helical versus horizontal grooves. So you'd think that surely that this has been discussed somewhere in the literature, if not on the television documentaries. So it turns out that this has been addressed, and here is where we get into the real proof of just how flimsy the mainstream position on this truly is. Dennis Stocks is the gentleman working with Mark Lanner, he's pictured in the middle here, and his research and experiments, like the one shown in this Nova documentary, they're firmly lodged in mainstream literature. And Stocks was also one of Chris Dunn's most vocal critics. Now, quoting once more from Chris Dunn's book, uh, here he talks about the reaction to his article where he proposes an ultrasonic method of cutting stone. Quote, This idea, of course, while popular in some circles, was certainly not popular among Egyptologists, one of whom is Dennis Stocks, who writes, quote, Despite this apparent abundance of evidence, many people still argue that these simple tools were not capable of producing the artifacts that survive, and, therefore, that there had to be some as yet undiscovered technology that the Egyptians possessed. These supposed technologies include diamond tip saws and drills and even the use of sonic waves to cut stone." End quote. Stocks goes on to claim in his article that he had been able to replicate and demonstrate the efficiencies of the tools we know were in the ancient Egyptians' toolbox. His work is exhaustive and goes to great length in describing every step of his methods, and it includes photographs of bow drills, copper chisels, stone axes, and copper tubes for drilling into diorite using sand. With such a comprehensive and complete study of how simple, primitive tools were applied in prehistory, and with the support of academia behind him, it would seem that the subject of ancient technology was an open and shut case. The experiments by Stocks are lodged firmly in the academic record and are referenced by Dieter Arnold in Building in Egypt. This should be enough, we might think, to accept these findings and look no further for answers. Yet there is the nagging question spiralling around core number 7 in the Petrie Museum. Stocks described the results of a drilling experiment that was conducted in 1999 as part of his involvement with the Lena Hopkins Nova obelisk experiment. Regarding a core that he ground out of granite using quartz sand and a copper tube attached to a shaft and manually driven by a bow and sand, he writes, quote, Horizontal striations similar to the ancient ones on rose granite were visible both in the wall of the hole and upon the core, end quote. Stock's seemingly innocuous statement actually speaks to the heart of the debate regarding the technology used by the ancient Egyptians to drill granite. Horizontal striations, as opposed to helical grooves, would sink the sonic machining theory in a sea of vibrating quartz quicksand, where it will forever rest and, perhaps, be remembered by some as an interesting yet troublesome theory and by others as the product of an overactive imagination. Is it possible that Petrie was mistaken or confused when he described this core? Petrie's observations of a helical groove were explained by Stocks to be the result of the random action of quartz sand in the drilling process. This process produces, for the most part, horizontal striations, which he noted in his drilling experiment. End quote. As with most of the mainstream research on this topic, Dennis Stocks' experiments and his uh, articles, which ran in several publications in the late 90s, these things, they don't actually directly challenge Petrie's observations of a spiral groove that he observed on core number seven. They kind of skirt around the issue. And in this case, he just claims that what his, his experiments match, you know, all of the concentric grooves that we see on Old Kingdom drill cores. They don't directly challenge 
uh, the observations that Petrie made. But you can see that Chris Dunn is starting to sort of question the things that Petrie's saying because at this point he hasn't actually examined the evidence for himself. However, there were some researchers that did try to tackle Petrie's claims and they tried to directly disprove the things that Petrie was saying about core number seven. John Reed, an acoustics engineer, and Harry Brownlee, a stonemason and a sculptor, travelled to London in order to examine Petrie's core number seven for themselves. They photographed the core in detail, and they concluded that the grooves were horizontal, not helical, as Petrie had claimed. Their conclusion, which conveniently matches the orthodox premise of tube drilling with sand or abrasive powder, was cited in Ian Lawton and Chris Ogilvy Herald's book, Giza the Truth. Quoting from Giza the Truth, they, Reed and Brownlee, make the critical distinction, not effectively made by Dunn, between the horizontal striations that are found on all cores and spiral striations, which are genuinely connected spiral grooves. Reed and Brownlee have examined and photographed this core in minute detail and report that even on this they can detect only horizontal striations. They can only conclude that there may have been some confusion in the labelling of the artefact at the museum. End quote. It's kind of a little disingenuous just to suggest that this whole thing boils down to some sort of mislabeling affair at the museum when you have all of Petrie's words and his conclusions that it was spiral. It's not just labeled incorrectly. Petrie stated many times that it was spiral. And it's also worth noting at this point that Petrie provided actual proof. He provided detailed measurements for his observations of a spiral groove, and he did this more than once because he faced considerable kickback for these claims himself and these measurements can still be found in his publications. So, in that case, what's the actual evidence that's cited by Reed and Brownlee for their conclusion that these grooves are horizontal? Well, they don't really have any evidence. Their evidence is that they took photographs, and that's it. They didn't take measurements, they didn't do any real analysis, they just took photographs. So they're citing photographs as evidence. Well, Chris Dunn decided to take a little closer look at said photographs. Quoting from Chris Dunn's book once again, quote, It is noteworthy that Reed and Brownlee are confident in describing horizontal striations. On a truncated cone such as core number seven, it requires more than visual inspection to determine if a groove with a slight pitch or distance between the start and end point in a 360 degree turn is helical or horizontal. Petrie provided dimensions in his analysis, while neither Stocks, nor Reed, nor Brownlee, nor Lawton, nor Ogilvy Herald have provided any measurements to support their assertion that Petrie's observations were incorrect, only that they, quote, had examined the core in minute detail, end quote. It is easy to be mistaken when we examine Petrie's core number seven to try and determine if the grooves are spiral or horizontal. It is especially easy to make a mistake if we examine a photograph in which the core is tilted to one side, such as in the photograph pictured in Giza the Truth. Before travelling to England to examine the core firsthand, I suspected that their conclusions were in error after I examined their photograph in my graphics program. Plate 25A shows core number 7 as seen in Giza the Truth. Plate 25B shows core number 7 in a corrected orientation with a vertical central axis. A construction reference frame is provided so that the tilt can be seen, and a horizontal dashed line was added to compare it with the grooves on the granite core. The horizontal dashed line indicates that the grooves appear to be horizontal in plate 25A and tilted in plate 25B. End quote. So they tilted the photographs. They rotated the photograph on the page so that when you're looking at it in the book, it looks like the lines on the core are straight, but it's, they've actually rotated the core such that the lines actually look straight. Now, I have to give them some benefit of the doubt. This was either a very unfortunate mistake that was made, or if it was deliberate, you could only describe this as being somewhat deceptive. It's, it's kind of a really cheap trick to try and pull on the audience to then make a claim that you know the, the grooves are horizontal. And I'm really thankful that Chris Dunn caught this and exposed it in his book. And at this point in the story, Chris Dunn decides, well, it's time to go to England. It's time to go and examine this troublesome drill core number seven for myself. And in fact, he makes two trips to England to do this. He goes in 99 and then again in 2003. And to cut a long story a little bit shorter, he completely vindicates Petrie's claim of a spiral groove. As an engineer with extensive experience working with precision tools and manufacturing, Dunn is one of the most qualified people you could ever hope to take on this task, at least in my opinion, and I'm very grateful that he did. 
He updated Petrie's measurements with modern precision equipment, and he was able to trace a spiral groove along the length of the core with cotton, as shown here. Other people, notably Malcolm McClure, a retired engineer, were also able to replicate this same experiment. Quoting Dunn, I performed the same thread wrap around the core with Mr. McClure and Miss Annie's observing closely. After achieving 16 wraps around the core, I could sense that Mr. McClure was anxious to try it himself, and he eagerly took the core and thread from me and set to work wrapping the thread around the core, being careful to fit it into the groove as he went. After performing several wraps himself, he declared that he was speechless. End quote. So even after examining the core for himself, even after showing and writing articles on his website, showing his findings and doing this cotton wrap thread, Dunn decided that still more proof was required to prove out that the grooves were in fact spiral. He was still facing significant resistance even after he published this article. People were arguing about the same pictures, the same rotated pictures and saying, look, the lines are straight. So he went to the next step. He had a detailed latex molding of the drill core made and then set about to prove that the grooves were spiral using geometry. By rolling out the mold onto a flat surface and by carefully referencing the two edges to each other, you can geometrically show if an arc of a groove is horizontal or helical. No surprise here, his conclusion, a spiral groove. This sort of technique, rolling out a cone onto a flat surface, this type of thing is used by engineers in industrial design for many different things, things like gas turbine engines. So this is proof of a nature that is very hard to argue against. And furthermore, all of his work, all of his data and his results are available on his website and they're in his book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And I would highly recommend that you pick up a copy if you're interested in this topic or at least visit his website for more of the details. Quoting Chris Dunn one more time. Readers are welcome to perform their own analysis of these photographs, but my final conclusion based on Malcolm McClure's and my on-site inspection, as well as the flat layout of the surface with arcs applied, is that the grooves around the Petri Core 7 is a spiral rather than individual horizontal striations, as claimed by Reed and Brownlee and others. Moreover, this spiral groove travels the full length of the core, and any discontinuities are due to the ripping out of the mica, a constituent of the granite with some discontinuities seen as faint lines on the latex peel, but on the granite core they cannot be seen with the naked eye. Taking into consideration Petrie's own account, my inspection in 1999, and Malcolm McClure and my inspection in 2003, along with analysis of the latex impression of the core, the question as to whether the groove is horizontal or spiral appears to be answered. End quote. What this ultimately leaves us with is a real mystery, but it's conclusively a mystery, and it's conclusively something that cannot be explained from within our current paradigm of history. This is my opinion, and that's really all it is, so take it for what it's worth, but I think the idea of an advanced ancient civilization being responsible for this tube drilling is both an entirely possible scenario, and it's one that makes sense out of many of the historical mysteries and contradictions like these tube drills. I think that when we see evidence for advanced machining, or the precision objects like the boxes or the stone vases, or some of the greatest examples of megalithic stone architecture, what we're looking at is the remnants and the remains of an unknown and a technologically advanced ancient civilization. One that most likely existed well before the Younger Dryas, and one whose past stretches deep into what we know as the Last Ice Age. I think that this civilization existed on the planet alongside with the more primitive hunter-gatherer subsets of humanity that we know existed in these times. And I think that this civilization was wiped out almost entirely during the cataclysmic end to the Ice Age that happened some 13,000 years ago. And this was the same event that wiped out fully half of the megafauna on the planet. Tales of this event and some of this civilization's cosmic knowledge like the motions of the heavens were encased in oral stories and traditions and these eventually became religions. And these tales of epic destruction, the remaking of the world, and some of their cosmic knowledge have persisted down into even today's religions. When humanity eventually rose again and restarted civilization as we know it, they got a big kickstart from some of these remnants and some of this knowledge from their ancient precursors. And I think this was particularly prevalent in the Old Kingdom of Egypt. As I've said many times across my videos, the ancient Egyptians themselves described their own civilization as a legacy of their ancestors. So let's summarize this tale. 
Over the past 150 years, there has essentially been two schools of thought when it comes to Old Kingdom tube drill use. On one side, we have Petrie and Dunn with comprehensive engineering and metrology focused detailed examinations of the evidence. Their investigations conclusively show there is a deep spiral groove on the pieces in question. They follow that evidence and it leads us to some startling and some challenging conclusions about how these holes and these cores were cut. On the other side of this, we have what I'll collectively call the mainstream position. And although I do know that there is plenty of nuance here, they do all uniformly disagree with Petrie and Dunn because, well, because they just can't have been an advanced civilization before the Egyptians. And they say this in lots of different ways without ever actually addressing the evidence for said advanced civilization. Primitive methods simply must have been used because, well, there just isn't any other option, so therefore spiral grooves are simply not possible because of what they mean. We can only have horizontal striations on our drill core. And for evidence, they mostly dodge this argument entirely. They never ever seem to mention the word spiral, and they have lots and lots of experiments that show tube drills cutting into stone with abrasive powder and leaving these resultant horizontal striations. And we even have some mainstream television shows doing this and then just declaring victory. That could be Fourth Dynasty, Dennis. And I have to say, these guys are not going to find any arguments from me on this. This method of using sand and copper tubes, quite clearly it does work for cutting granites. You can do tube drilling this way, but it just doesn't bear any resemblance at all to the evidence that's in the archaeological record. These marks don't match at all what Petrie has observed on core number seven or on several other of the drill holes and cores that he talks about. And then, a hundred years or so after Petrie makes his just astonishing observations about these drill cores, somebody finally decides to directly challenge Petrie's observation and tries to prove that he was incorrect. And what do we get? Well, we know what we get. We get something that was either an unfortunate mistake or it was just a cheap and slightly deceptive attempt to fool the public. Rotated photographs of a spiral cut drill core that tries to fool you into believing that the grooves are horizontal. Put yourself in the position of judge here. If you were honest and if you were open-minded about history and if you were trying to make a judgment on this topic for yourself based on the evidence and based on the considered opinions of scholars and researchers that have weighed in on this over a 150 year period, which of these two sides would you choose? I think it's a real shame that there is such strong resistance to what is some very good work that's been done by both Petrie and Chris Dunn here. I think we could stand to learn an awful lot if we opened our mind to the possibility that this is actually what it seems to be, that it's evidence of some unknown form of ancient high technology. Who knows what we could learn if we just applied ourselves to uncovering these secrets and we applied ourselves with scientific purpose and real vigor. And that's all I'm really calling for here. It's the same thing that I always try to say in my videos. We should be doing more open-minded and scientifically based research into these topics and into these mysteries and then following the evidence no matter where it leads. I want the institutions, the organizations that control the funding, those that green light the expeditions and the scientific investigations to really consider all of this evidence and to explore the premise that maybe something pretty advanced was going on at some point deep in the past and that maybe we'd get somewhere if we just investigate these sites and these mysteries with that perspective in mind. Over the last 30 years, we have vastly expanded our horizons when it comes to just how old the human species is. And we now know that the biggest damn cataclysm to hit the planet in the last 5 million years happened barely 13,000 years ago. Yet in that same time frame of 30 years, if not in the last 150 years, our view on the history of human civilizations has barely budged an inch. Now I understand that entrenched establishment positions need a lot of evidence to force some change, but honestly, it seems to me that we're at this point now. And it's time to at least start considering the possibility of an ancient and unknown advanced civilization being responsible for so many of these mysteries and contradictions that we see represented in megalithic architecture all around the world. There are lots of drill holes left for us to examine in Egypt, and we should be out there making latex impressions of them all just as fast as we can and trying to preserve these precious examples of ancient technology. As far as I know though, nothing of the sort is going on and the only person who has even attempted a real scientific investigation into this is Chris Dunn and he did that on Petrie's core number 7 that's housed in the Petrie Museum in London. Now I think he closed the discussion on this particular core 
and the mainstream essentially just seems to want to stay quiet and hope that not that many people get to hear his argument. I personally know of 10 probably more drill holes that would really benefit from a similar examination. And there are certainly more drill cores in the Egyptian museum and in other locations around the world. If somebody wants to fund it, heck, I'd certainly volunteer to go around making latex molds and taking measurements. But this really is something suited to an archaeological department of a university. I'm just some punter yelling stuff from the cheap seats. So, where does this leave us? I said at the beginning of this documentary that I would prove to you that the ancient Egyptian tube drills are evidence of some form of lost ancient high technology, and that they left a signature that was beyond even our capabilities. And I think I've shown plenty of proof between Petrie and Chris Dunn that the grooves around core number seven and other examples that Petrie talks about are in fact spiral. And when you consider what that means, it means that the feed rate into granite is roughly 500 times greater than what we can achieve today with our modern diamond tip drills and all of our hydraulics and advanced machinery. I think that qualifies as something that's beyond our capability. What do I think actually explains these tube drills? Well, I can honestly say that I just don't know. I just don't have the frame of reference to really answer that question. I really hope that we have the courage to one day actually find out. This was also Chris Dunn's conclusion when it comes to the drill cores, and I want to particularly just acknowledge and to thank him for his perseverance in the face of so much opposition and for his just most excellent contributions to this field. I'd like to close out this presentation and leave you with one last quote from Chris Dunn, where he speculates a little bit as to a possible method that might be able to create Petrie's core number seven. Quote, with respect to what methods the ancient Egyptians used to create core number seven, I have no real answers. However, to replicate the core and holes, an experimentalist might consider softening the granite using heat. Does the burnished finish on the surface of core number seven, as well as the random runs between the grooves and the proliferation of depressions where mica is removed, along with the spiral groove itself, indicate that these characteristics might be replicated if the granite was brought close to its melting point? Such a method may involve using a tool, similar to a thermal lance, that sacrifices its material in the process. Until an answer is found, Petrie's core number seven will remain in its case at the Petrie Museum as evidence of one of Egypt's mysterious lost technologies." End quote. Well, there it is, the mystery of the Egyptian tube jewels. Let me know what you think about them in the comments below. I'm sure that there'll be plenty of comments and uh, questions. I'm sure there'll be some inevitable concerns. Uh, I actually have a number of offcuts and a whole few other sections that I've dropped from this video that I'll probably release as short follow-on videos to this one. I'm pretty happy to be done and finished making this video. It's been a couple years in the works, this one, and it's been a big effort over the past few months. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that supported the channel, uh, in particular the executive producers list. You people know who you are and you know why you're on that list. Uh, I also definitely want to thank everybody that supports me via Patreon or Subscribestar or who donates via PayPal. You really do make all of this possible. It's the only way that I can spend the time to make these videos, so thank you very much. And along those lines, if you do like this kind of work and if you get something from what I'm doing, please do consider supporting Uncharted X via the value for value model. You can find out all the ways to do that over at unchartedx.com slash support. The value for value model, it's a pretty simple model. It goes along the lines of, if you get any value from my work, if you like the kind of thing that I'm doing and you wanna see it continue, then it would be great if you could return some of that value back to me. That's the only way I can make these videos. So maybe you share the video with your friends, Maybe it's worth the price of a cup of coffee. Maybe it's like tipping a server or a movie ticket, something like that. You can pretty much, your choice, decide what uh, value you want to put back into it. So I very much appreciate everybody that does support the channel. And I've got a lot of stuff that I'm working on. And I will see all you guys in the next video. Peace. <laughs>